I'm kind of called a thorium expert a lot, but it's molten salt reactors, that's my field. So talking about different aspects of how we can design molten salt reactors, basically breeder or burner are one of the main categories we can differentiate here. Breeder, of course, makes its own fuel after startup. You need fuel to start them though. If we make just enough, we call that break even, and that's kind of nice. You don't have fuel coming in or going out, but that does require continuous processing to remove fission products from the salt. A burner design or a converter design or what I'm gonna focus on, which is the DMSR, denatured molten salt reactor, that does need annual fizzle makeup, uh, but it can skip that fuel processing. And that is a surprisingly large advantage. And just in general, much, much less uh, research and develop needed. And you can really uh, simplify your core design. Uh, molten salt reactor advantages, increased safety, reduced cost, resource sustainability, greatly reduced long-lived waste. I want to focus a little bit on resource sustainability and long-lived waste to differentiate between breeder and burner. The breeder design, once you start that, it is pretty amazing, only about one ton of thorium, but uh, most designs that at least work in the chemical processing, you might lose a little bit of thorium. So it's actually up to about 10 tons of thorium per gigawatt year, but that's still basically free fuel. Maybe $30,000 worth of thorium, giving a half billion dollars worth of electricity. But you must, when you're talking fuel costs, you must add the fuel processing cost and of course the cost of that starting fissile material. Converter designs are simpler and only require very modest amounts of uranium when we're running them on low enriched uranium. Uh, Oak Ridge's main design, the DMSR, uh, typically about 35 tons of uranium per gigawatt year versus about 200 tons for a light water reactor. And those are very specific known costs that add up only to about a tenth of a cent per kilowatt hour. It's really hard to imagine kind of improvements. And I will say that uranium is not the enemy, okay? Uh, only cheap uranium is in limited supply. Now, Canon uh, showed us very important things about potential bottlenecks in the uranium supply. But in general, uh, if you allow the price of uranium to increase, there's a rule of thumb. If the real price of a, a metal or a mineral, et cetera, doubles, you basically about 10 times the reserves, okay? So we could have bottlenecks, and I agree with that. Um, but if you allow the price to rise, uh, let's say $500 a kilogram, that's gonna really hurt light water reactors, not really put them out of business, uh, but that does next to nothing to these more efficient designs. So it's only about two cents a kilowatt, and we have unlimited supplies at that. Uranium mining, it has a bad image, but it's only a tiny fraction of world mining, less than a tenth of a percent, and it's good employment, okay? Uh, if uranium is used in these designs, these converters, we could have all our electricity, 2,500 gigawatts, without increasing current mining. And of course, we're not gonna get rid of hydro and uh, wind and solar should play their 10 to 20% part. So if we do uh, get rid of the old fleet and introduce these, we could, have, we could be sustaining things with a lot less mining. Uh, getting on to long-lived waste, fission products, they're almost all benign after a few hundred years, okay? We have a very small number of long-lived and they're, they're really not that much of an issue. It's really transuranics, everything above uranium, neptonium, plutonium, etc. That's the real reason for Yucca Mountains, which are repositories, places you want to put things because you might want to take them back later. Uh, all molten salt reactor designs produce a lot less transuranics and we can either keep recycling them continuously back into the reactor or with the DMSR design, well, I'll show more later, we basically keep them in. Um, and that, as long as we're doing that, we can have up to a 10,000 fold improvement over transuranic waste uh, compared to conventional once through designs and even including MOX use doesn't really improve things very well. Re-examining molten salt reactors, they're often thought of as the thorium reactor, that's, that's the label, okay? Uh, but by mandate, they were developed to be breeder reactors to compete with sodium fast breeders. The belief at the time was we, there's almost no uranium in the world. We'll have a few years worth of these submarine reactors and then it'll be all either fast breeders or molten salt reactors. We now know a lot better. Molten salt reactors can be burners or breeders, but the choices really have to come down to pragmatic facts, not ideology or imposed funding mandates that you have to be a, a breeder, et cetera. But no one can dispute the success of basically pitching things as thorium. And the message I'm trying to get across here is, is come for the thorium, but stay for the reactor. Um, I, I didn't have time to make, uh, I'll, I'll get John to make t-shirts for the next one, I guess. But. Uh, back to breeder versus, uh, researchers do tend to focus on the breeder. I was the same way. I didn't want to look at these converter designs for the first few years I was into this. Uh, but when you really look at the R&D and operational costs of continuous processing, it's a lot higher than people assume. Salt, pressing, salt processing should be much cheaper than with solid fuels. 
But you have to remember, anything nuclear related, things do get very expensive. Solid fuel processing, conservatively about $2,000 a kilogram. Now, how much cheaper would salt processing be? Liquid fuels, a lot cheaper. 90% cheaper, 95, 99. When you look at the standard molten salt breeder reactor, that's where we have the most data. To match the fuel cycle cost of DMSR processing, all that processing would be, need be less than a dollar a kilogram. I don't think you can say you're going to have a 2,000 fold reduction. Now, other designs will have uh, need to process less, etc. But I think this, this, this issue gets uh, swept under the rug a little bit too much. So when you remove that requirement of breed, you open up all manners of design simplification. A burner has almost negligible fuel costs, assured resources. Uh, enhanced anti-proliferation features, uh, simpler R&D. So it appears the obvious choice, and of course at any point down the road we can, we can be at the same time investigating breeder options or convert later. So what is this DMSR converter reactor I'm talking about? Oak Ridge developed this. This was kind of the last uh, great advance they had on the molten salt program. Uh, very little funding. It was developed in the late 70s. It was uh, designed to be a gigawatt output, starting up with low enriched uranium as high as enrichment as they could do safely, like for proliferation, so they could squeeze in as much thorium as they can to basically make the neutronic budget a little better. Uh, but there's no salt processing. Just add small amounts of low enriched uranium manually that we buy off the market. Uh, pretty low starting fissile, and it's the same thing that uh, other reactors use. Better reactivity coefficients than MSBR. Uh, if people want to ask me about that later, it's an interesting fact. And they only required about a, a one-sixth annual uranium needs of a conventional reactor or uh, Candus are a little better, but these are still much, much better in Candu. And again, that fuel processing cost, there's no fabrication, et cetera, and a lot less of it, very small. A light water reactor might be 0.6 to 1 cent a kilowatt hour. After that 30 year batch of salt, the uranium can be removed and, and reused. That's fairly straightforward. Uh, Transuranics, this is where it becomes kind of a national choice. If you want to put them in the ground and bury them, that's your choice. But I'd like to see them recycled, and this is a one-time job. There's only gonna be about one ton of these transuranics in the entire batch of salt for gigawatt reactor. So if you assume, you always have to assume a small amount of processing loss, and a tenth of a percent is a, is a typical goal. If, and that's the goal when we talk about processing the other, uh, the, the pure cycle, that really only means then about one kilogram of transuranics going to waste over 30 years. And that's actually as good or even better than most cases that are examined with what we call the pure cycle, the pure thorium U233, because you're processing a lot more rapidly, more often, et cetera. And this is the only real reactor, I won't get into the details. You can really say that this reactor, because we're burning a little bit of low enriched uranium, we're actually destroying or transmuting a fair amount of natural radiotoxicity from the ground. And in this case, after 300 years, and if we do these things to recycle the transuranics, we can make the claim that we're actually less, the planet is less radiotoxic than when we started. After that 300 year waiting period, where we can trust an engineer to vitrify or, or to make things that aren't going to leak into the water table, etc. The thorium reactor has the pure cycle has pretty much the same output, but they don't transmute as much. Uh, how does the DMSR do so good? Every, well, I, I do talks a lot in Canada, and heavy water is sort of king in Canada, but every, isn't heavy water the best moderator? The big thing is, is far less parasitic, parasitic losses of neutrons. We don't have any internal structure, no burnable poisons, uh, and a lot less neutron leakage. Light water reactor is typically about 22% of parasitic losses, and that's not even including fission products. Candu is much better at 12%, but the DMSR is way down here at about 5%. So that's really the, 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 the real reason they're so good. Plus, about half of your fission products actually leave as gases. Uh, the xenon and krypton, a lot of things that started as xenon and krypton come right out. And of course, the most important xenon 135 that just absorbs great amounts of neutrons. Extremely high proliferation resistance. I'll zip, zip through this. We're not really processing. The, the salt stays in there for a long period of time. The uranium is always denatured, meaning it's, it's low enough in fissile content. You can't use it as a weapon. Uh, any plutonium present, it's really low quality, very dilute and a very radioactive salt, and really hard to remove. Like comparing to light water, PU, a lot more spontaneous fission, a lot more heat rate. So if it's virtually impossible for light water, uh, spent plutonium to be weaponized, it should be that much more impossible for these. These reactors have no way to sort of put things in, take them out, to, uh, to put in some kind of fertile material to take it out. 
Uh, and some of the last old people say, well, you can still have enrichment plants. Well, we're going to have a lot less of them. But if you don't like enrichment, well, we can, we can have a synergy with, uh, say, a natural uranium reactor like you can do. Can do produces a lot of plutonium, actually. So on the single site, you could have a can do feeding its waste plutonium as the makeup fuel for several DMSRs. Uh, so basically, natural uranium in, electricity and fission products out. Non-denatured uh, designs, lifters, well, lifter is supposed to be a larger category, but everyone kind of has their own ideas of, of the best ways. There is interesting non-proliferation features, but it is true that likely there's no expert you find on proliferation resistance that would, that would tell you it's an improvement over existing reactors, okay? It does have advantages. But these widespread claims of thorium being a solution to proliferation, it's only going to hurt us in the long run. The effects of U-232 are greatly exaggerated, okay? They are important, they're great for detection, etc. but it's not going to kill you instantly, it's not going to kill you in, you can sit next to it for weeks or months before you'd ever get a lethal dose. And that's after it's built up for many, many years to build up the data products. So see Dr. Ralph Moyer's paper or other on the effects here. Um, the other, yes, a country developing graphite pile, that's a lot easier, but not if you could buy a reactor right off the market that's got tons of the U-233. So proliferation dangers will always be exaggerated by those who pose nuclear power, but I don't think the answer is making similar exaggerations the other way, because we're going to get caught on these in the end. So there is a very good case for all these reactors being uh, not a proliferation worry, but please quit the great exaggerations we see. Okay, uh, getting back to the Oak Ridge designs, which had very little uh, time or funding on these. So there's a lot of... Uh, fertile ground for improvement. Shorter batches of the salt. I don't really like the 30-year cycles. As long as you recycle the uranium in these designs, because there's a, there's a fair amount of fizzle still trapped up there and it's fairly easy, transuranic can wait or you get a large improvement in the uranium needs. 10 to 15 year batches are what I'd probably more like to see. Uh, and you can pretty easily get things down to about 20 tons of uranium per gigawatt year. So it's really not that more, much more than even the, even the breeder cycle. And that is just about 10% of light water reactors. So again, all the world's electricity, but we're not gonna get rid of uh, hydro, et cetera. So we, we can actually get by with a lot less mining. What about no thorium? So uh, duck the tomatoes coming in here, but um, running without thorium actually does have some interesting advantages. We can start on much more common, 5% 5, 5 or low enrichment. The neutron economy is not as good, but it's still absolutely excellent compared to existing reactors. There's no protactinium, and typically the melting points of these salts are, are less when we don't have thorium. I want to cover a lot of things, so I'm not really going to get into new options. Not much ready for public disclosure, and I apologize, I said the last thing, same thing last time. But a very obvious thing is Oak Ridge's work has been sort of by, by force on solid fuel, triso fueled molten salt cooled. They've come up with a great deal of tricks for doing that better, and it's quite obvious that these same tricks can be used in molten salt fueled. Uh, just replace the triso fuel with just graphite, put the fuel in the salt, and you've got a pretty excellent design as well. Molten salt reactors in Canada. CANDU 6 is a, is a good design, available now, but there's no new R&D for the fu foreseeable future since it was sold to uh, SNC Lavalin. So we have an enormous nuclear brain test basically going to waste. We went our own way before on the CANDU, we can do it again. And CANDU also has unique opportunities in our oil sands. And again, our oil sands, most of it is, uh, it's not going to be mined, it's all in situ where you use steam assisted gravity drainage, you make steam uh, pump, pump and down, it basically uh, helps heat up and dissolve the oil and it gets sucked back up. They need uh, pretty high pressure steam over a thousand psi etc uh, and there's a lot of things that molten salt reactors can fit in but I don't really have time. The oil sands allure it's always been around in Canada. Long viewed as an ideal proving ground. You don't need a turbine and that's 30 to 40 percent of your capital cost already. You don't need R&D for a new turbine and I, a little joke here but ask the South Africans they had to develop, for their pebble bed work, they had to develop a whole new turbine that was costing as much or more than the entire nuclear program. And of course, these reactors would be used in a, in a remote situation. Uh, many studies have shown that the uh, uh, nuclear-produced steam is cost-effective for these oil sands used. Um, 
And uh, what scared me at first as well, these old studies had pretty low dollars per watt for the nuclear, but the, the cost of the natural gas systems had risen even faster. Um, and oil sands producers expected to pay $200 billion on carbon taxes over the next 35 years. And those funds are mandated to be on, spent on clean tech uh, solutions. So this is, uh, there's, there's quite a great source. So why not conventional nu uh, nuclear power? Um, basically, a, a study pointed out the facilities are too large. We just can't uh, pump the steam around wide enough to use it. The pressures are too low and not flexible. Uh, and the steam just can't be pushed around far enough. Ideal size is 300 to 400 megawatts thermal for a 30,000 barrel a day uh, facility. Um, other potential small mo module actors, there's problems with all, mainly about the, the steam pressures are too low. Uh, we can talk about that later. The basic idea is using a, the MSR molten salt reactor combined with SAG-D. We produce steam much higher temperature than needed, so we can either save money by doing it lower temperatures, or you use the top end of that steam uh, for electricity generation, for generating hydrogen by thermochemical or high temperature electrolysis, etc. because there's a lot of money that needs to be spent on upgrading of the bitumen on site. Bottom line, there's, there's a massive amount of oil available there. The molten salt reactors could help us get that out and basically uh, we want to get off oil. Uh, molten salt reactors, oil sands can help molten salt reactors come to being and with time molten salt reactors are bridged and not needing that oil in the first place. But we could get North America off foreign oil pretty easy. Very quickly on the Canadian pieces, I'm working on various, trying to keep things simple as possible. Uh, I've got a big network of connections around the world, et cetera, working with a group that we're going to speak here, but they couldn't make it down. Uh, yeah, very bright guys work on how to integrate this into oil sands. Biggest news though is the interest of a large Canadian uh, based engineering firm which is, uh, it's not really a super secret, some people might even guess here. They don't really want to publicize, they probably publicize soon, so please don't push them that much. Uh, but uh, efforts led by ex-ACL, a uh, member who headed advanced reactor studies, uh, they're hiring a team and working on collaboration agreements with me. Uh, we've been working towards a consortium, including McMaster's and University of Ontario Institute of Technology, our two largest engineering schools, along with Chalk River Labs, and those talks have been going very good. It's amazing the, the level of interest that we're getting in the university system, and of course, University of Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan has, a, has their own great interest in small modular actors, and of course, Oak Ridge. The CNS, uh, I won't really go into it. Bottom line is, that's our version of the NRC. Talks with them have been very encouraging. Um, and we, they have changed their system to be streamlined for small module reactors. So then again, government of Saskatchewan is very interested. So conclusions, by any standard molten salt reactors are superior to all other offerings, not just by marginal improvements. They were mandated to be breeders, but I really think the simplified converter options appear an obvious route forward, at least for the short term. Uh, it takes large and far-sighted investment, but, the, but potential returns are enormous. And all factors do seem to be pointing to Canada to be ideal focal point of a broader North American effort to realize this for the world. Because we're not going to do this without the U.S., without Oak Ridge expertise, etc. But I think we can do it a lot easier a little north of the border. So thank you very much.